things are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> just went through am i right everyone yes welcome back to another fun-filled and exciting episode of animat's crazy cartoon cast how have you all been everyone i hope you all had a wonderful weekend i hope you all had a great time and uh hopefully you managed to survive throughout the week because oh boy what we went through is just pure madness and especially for me I literally had an extra dose of madness, or at least uh, an extra obstacle to go through uh, quite an eventful week that I have been, mainly because of the fact that um, you probably remember last week on the last episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, in which you may have realized that maybe my voice wasn't as 100% uh, as usual. Well, there actually was a reason for that because later on, like the day afterwards, it turned out that I actually was developing strep throat again. It was something that kept on happening. Ooh, oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jay Monty, for the subscription. Real nice of you. Uh, but anyways, yes, uh, unfortunately, I was developing strep throat. And uh, thankfully, at the moment that I realized I had it, uh, not long afterwards, like probably the day later, I actually went to go and get some, uh, antibiotics, uh, like I went to see a doctor, talked about it, and, uh, you know, went to go and grab some pills, so, uh, following afterwards, uh, following after that, uh, I did end up becoming significantly better, so, I'm pretty much at the point where, uh, my throat is all better, but now I pretty much have a brand new goal where, uh, now I need to go and get rid of my tonsils because it's becoming to the point where it's almost annually where I develop some kind of disease or an infection in my tonsils, especially when um, it, it was like around the end of 2020 where it has gotten so bad where it sent me to the ER. So I never thought I would have a New Year's resolution, but now I do have one and it's to get rid of these stupid tonsils so that I can no longer have these stupid stupid infections in my mouth. All right, but um, again, we went through such a crazy week, and one, one in which I need to say, uh, state right now is that uh, unfortunately, we did lose um, someone who is very uh, well known in the animation world, especially for his voice. Uh, the original voice of Charlie Brown, sadly, Peter Robbins, has passed away. He has been known to have uh, a lot of health issues, had a very troubling life after he voiced Charlie Brown, and uh, un uh, has sadly taken his life at the uh, young age of 65. So it's just something I want to quickly mention. Uh, uh, may he rest in peace. And please, if you're not in a well, stable position in your life, if, if things are going really badly for you, then please go and talk to someone because taking your life is not a good solution to go through. And there are people out there who will go and help you and will make sure that your life can go on track. So this is just something that uh, I want to bring up immediately in response to the unfortunate passing of uh, Peter Robbins. But yes, other than that, though, uh, sorry to quickly change the mood immediately, but uh, we got a whole bunch of stories that we got to go through. And uh, I would like to go and ask the chat wall right now. Are you guys ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it, folks. Are you prepared? Okay, let's see what we got here. Yep, I see. I see people are ready. People are set. That is great to hear. And with all that said and none, it is now time that we shall go and get things started. And with our first story, actually with our first batch of stories that we have here for debatably most of this episode, I will warn you right now, because we are about to enter into some controversies. These are stories in which got the internet really talking, 
and some of them, well, some may have uh, sparked a lot of outrage, and we may go into some uh, controversial subject matter, so this may be a case of viewer's discretion is advised, but... Either way, I know that we are all crazy enough to go and jump into them here. Oh boy, it's controversial. Well, that will make it a little bit more fun than usual. And with the first one that we are going to be diving right into, let's go ahead and talk about the controversy revolving Snow White. Yes, uh, specifically though, not the uh, original classic from 1937 or 1938, depending on uh, which release date you want to go with, but I'm talking about the upcoming live action remake from Disney that they are planning because already there's been a lot of talks regarding this, and this is especially coming from uh, a well-respected and well-beloved actor, Peter Dinklage. Now, for those of you who don't know what happened, Peter Dinklage, uh, he recently went on a uh, podcast, the uh, WTF podcast by Mark Marin, and they both talked a bit about his career and stuff like that, often having a chat. But then Peter Dinklage brings up the discussion about the live action remake of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and uh, had a few choice words to describe how he feels regarding the live action remake and the fact that Disney would go and do this. Um, he would go here and state, and uh, by the way, I am reading this from my source on, um, on The Hollywood Reporter. As it states, he says... Literally no offense to anyone, but I was a little taken aback when they were very proud to cast a Latina actress as Snow White, which uh, for context, by the way, um, Rachel Zegler, who bro who uh, is the uh, starring role of Maria in West Side Story, is going to be playing Snow White. But you're still telling the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Take a step back and look at what you're doing there. It makes no sense to me. You're progressive in one way, but then you're still making a fucking backwards story about seven dwarves living in a cave together? What the fuck are you doing, man? Have I done nothing to advance the cause for, from my soapbox? I guess I'm not loud enough. So that's pretty much uh, the big thing about this. And he also commented that no, he's not going to be playing one of the dwarves in uh, Snow White. However, with that said, though... After he did make that response and that it did spark a lot of conversations on social media, Disney did respond to this eventually. And they pretty much said to Peter Dinklage, don't worry, dude. I, we, we, know, we know how you feel and we got your back on this. To which Disney responded by saying here, to avoid reinforcing stereotypes from the original animated film, we are taking a different approach with these seven characters and have been consulting with members of the dwarfism community. We look forward to sharing more as the film heads into production after a lengthy development period. And so far, when it comes to uh, this uh, movie, when it comes to the live action remake of Snow White, so far, it is still pretty early in production, and as they state, they haven't actually started production yet. And what we do know so far is the uh, is that the main cast that they have, uh, as I mentioned before, they got Rachel Zegler as Snow White, and also Gal Gadot is going to be playing the Evil Queen. Other than that, though, we don't really know when this is going to be coming out, but we know that this is going to be a thing that Disney is doing, and that... They're most likely going to make this uh, ha or they're most likely going to have this be a bigger deal than the usual live action remakes or uh, basically the kind that they would put up on the big screen instead of something that they would directly release onto Disney Plus. OK, so that's kind of the big thing. The fact that Peter Dinklage would go and comment about the hypocrisy of Disney's progressive uh, viewpoint in, with their live action remake of Snow White. Now, one thing that I will go and immediately say, because what Peter Dinklage himself said about this is actually controversial. And one thing is for certain, I think we all know this as a fact it's regarding Disney and 
how they really do take pride in themselves in being highly progressive. In fact, debatably more than any other company out there, Disney pretty much is very proud of the fact and really does lean very heavily on the uh, diversity and the progressive aspect that really they, they, they want to go and be as inclusive as possible. Like they want the Disney brand to present themselves as something that is very inclusive, that is very progressive and a company that is always ahead of their time. Now, do they genuinely mean that? Maybe not, because it feels like maybe they're being progressive for the sake of profit than to actually help out uh, marginalized communities and stuff like that. But then again, at least they are being progressive. You know, it's like, you know, it's better to be progressive and like have me, you know, have reasons that might be questionable than to not be progressive. But the point is, is that Disney is one of the few companies out there or Disney. Well, maybe not one of the few companies, but they are pretty. They are one of the most prominent companies in which they know that being progressive is inclusive and inclusive is actually far more profitable than to be against those values. So that's pretty much the big thing with um, how Disney is and like with a lot of their movies that they are doing right now, uh, considering that they are going uh, more, you know, they're telling stories from the viewpoints of different marginalized groups uh, like, you know, it, it really shows that like they are trying to be very committed to that, especially when it comes to their animated films like uh, just last year with Disney animation, we have a uh, South, uh, you know, we got like a South Asian story with Ryan and the last dragon and we now have a colombian story with encanto so that's just one of the many examples of what disney is trying to do and some results can be great like raya and encanto and then there are other times when they really try to be inclusive it doesn't necessarily work as well you know it's it, it's one of those cases of results may vary but going back into the story that we are talking about, the fact that Peter Dinklage is calling Disney out that they're being, you know, they're being progressive in one way, but they're not being progressive amongst the dwarves. Now, one thing that I will say right now is that I 100% agree with what Peter Dinklage has to say. I completely understand where he's going with it because yeah in a way it is kind of true about um what disney is doing with uh, snow white and the seven doors or the live action remake where yeah again they're really trying to take pride on the fact that we, we're gonna have a latina snow white snow white ain't going to be a white girl she's gonna be a latina girl that makes us a lot more progressive and yet when it comes to the dwarves well, we haven't really heard any, like, to be fair, we haven't really heard anything of what Disney is going to do with the dwarves, but if they are going to do the same thing like they did with the uh, original animated classic, they're just going to make, like, a bunch of bumbling comic reliefs, yeah, that's not going to be a positive image towards little people, and keep in mind that when it, when it comes to uh, dwarfism and when it comes to little people, they're often one of the most overlooked marginalized groups, like, they're not not really as viewed as marginalized people as much as say black people or the lgbtq plus community and stuff like that like there's no true mo like they don't have a true moment in the spotlight to say that they are at a massive disadvantage compared to people that are at like average or regular height and stuff like that it's one of those major things that he wants to go and highlight, considering that, of course, Peter Dinklage himself is actually a dwarf, that he is smaller than than like any other like well-known actor out there. And yet, like he really is breaking the mold by appearing in many major roles, rather it be in like Game of Thrones or even in animated roles where like he would voice characters that are like way larger than life, like the pirate captain in Ice Age Collision Course or the great mighty eagle in uh, in the Angry Birds movie. Like, you know, it, 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 well, I was about to say, you know, it's kind of funny, but actually, no, that would be kind of offensive if I would say that. But the thing is with peter dinklage is that like he has like this low boom voice and like definitely like has a lower octave voice than me actually 
Uh, but but the point is, is that I do understand where he is going with this. And it also brought up um, uh, some very interesting reactions on social media because unfortunately it did show a bit of a dark side of the Disney fans where there are certain Disney fans out there where they were not on the side of Peter Dinklage and the way that they responded to him is actually pretty harsh. Like they didn't like they didn't want to listen to the criticisms that he has towards Disney and they decided to just attack him. Like one of the most common things and, and this is especially coming from the anti woke Disney fans out there, you know, the kind of people that would just blindly listen to YouTube channels such as like the quartering or geeks and gamers or whatever, the kind that would constantly complain about woke culture and PC culture and like only care about their own selfish white privileges and stuff like that. And they would go after Peter Dinklage by saying that, oh, he's just upset because he didn't get a part in the movie. If he were playing as either Doc or Grumpy or whatever, he wouldn't be complaining like this where like, yeah, it, it is a massive yikes moment because that's not necessarily the point that Peter Dinklage is trying to make. Like he's trying to speak for, well, in uh, in a way that, uh, how can I put this? He, he's speaking for his people, people who have dwarfism. And for someone who has dwarfism like me, like him, like he wants to speak, speak out for them. That's what he mainly wants to do. And yet people are just trying to pass off because they want to be blindly loyal to Disney. It's just, it, it was a bad moment for Disney fans because like it really does make them look like they're, you know, that they, they view Disney more like a cult in a way and that they're praising what the company does at all times and that they rather want to support what Disney is doing. And they think that, oh, well, Snow White is going to be a Latina. That's going to be, you know, that's going to be progressive enough. We don't have to do, you know, we don't have to go and do like all the other characters to for them to be super progressive. We don't need to have progressive characters of the dwarves. We can have Dopey going around going, <laughs> You know, we, we can't have those moments, honestly. It's it's ridiculous. Now, the fact... But now, we, we pretty much have the factor that what Disney is going to do, they did respond and they say that they are going to go and take action. And the fact that we are going to have different dwarves, or at least the way that they are going to be approaching them is not going to be exactly the same like how they were in the 1937 animated features. So what is this going to mean for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? What is it going to mean for this live action remake? Well, I think it is safe to say that it looks like Disney is going to be making a movie that will be a lot more different than what we got with the 1937 movie. It's not going to be the exact same where it's going to be like a shot for shot remake in the style of what we recently had with uh, Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin. It's going it, to there's going to be a lot more change ups. And at that point, we, we will wait and see with how this is going to go. This is going to ultimately determine if this is going to be something that people will enjoy or if this is going to be something that people will just like absolutely despise and they will just smash it to bits like most other Disney live action remakes. This is I, I feel like, honestly, this is going to be a case where the differences here are going to be the true make or break deal, because, yeah, there are going to be some people out there. Um, who want this to be more like a shot for shot remake of Snow White and they might not like it. But if the materials that they do offer uh, to make this more different than what we already had before, if it can stand out, then honestly, maybe it could be worthwhile, you know, like a great example that I can think of maybe like probably what I can imagine the best case scenario of what the Snow White movie is going to be will probably be something like the 2015 Cinderella movie. I know it's not necessarily the most memorable Disney live action remake out there, but that one I would say is fine. I, you know, I honestly don't really hate that, that one, and I find it to be one of the better ones, at least. Not a great movie per se, but I do find it to be the one where it's like, you know what, it's fine. Oh, and uh, thank you, uh, UsagiT1000, for that subscription right there. Uh, really appreciate that.
but yeah um honestly like that could be the best case scenario where like yeah you do have the familiar story of it but there are a few significant differences where it does stand on its own compared to the others however but the, the the big thing about this though the fact that it is a live action remake of snow white i do feel like it's going to be a bit more of a challenge mainly because of the fact that well it's gonna be another live action big budget hollywood adaptation of snow white and you probably remember back in the mid 2000 in the mid 2010s actually you know back when they started this whole trend of uh disney of like disney live action remakes and then you see other studios that they want to have a p you know they also want to have a piece of the pie there, there have been a few that actually did come out of it. There was uh, Mirror Mirror with Julia Roberts, uh, Julia Roberts, with Julia Roberts. And then there was also Snow White and the Huntsman starring Kirsten Dunst. And uh, I, wait, actually, I think it's Kirsten Dunst and Chris Hemsworth or Liam Hemsworth. One of the Hemsworths uh, at, at the very least. But um, my point is we've already gotten a lot of these like, Hollywood style big budgeted CG heavy Snow White movies before and that I think is going to be the bigger challenge for Disney is to find a way to not make it to not just have this stand out compared to the timeless classic that we all know and love but to also make it different from them and I think right there that's going to be the biggest challenge to truly find its own voice and not just feel like just another snow white adaptation and maybe they might have a little bit of a clue or of an idea of what they can do to make the seven dwarves a bit more different and i mean yeah like you can have the casting like be different races like you can have a latina snow white or whatever uh but honestly that's not necessarily going to do much if the personality is just going to remain the same and the script is just going to be just about the same as like what we've had uh before with the Walt Disney movie so that but but again like there might be some ways that they'll find to be different and uh, technically I did hear apparently there's going to be one extra casting that they have done that they brought in a guy and apparently the role he's going to play is neither the huntsman or the prince it's going to be this brand new character so it does sound like maybe there's going to be uh some changes that Disney is going to do to make this stand out but again it's going to be something that will be a massive test to see if the changes are going to be good enough to justify its existence and to make itself stand out compared to all the other Snow White adaptations. This is not going to be an easy movie for Disney to go and make. Yes, it'll be an easy movie for Disney to technically make because, well, as a Disney live action remake, it could probably be one that can make a lot of money. But in order to get it right... That is a major challenge right there. But then again, at the end of the day, there is still one question that I need to ask. Do we still need this, honestly? Like, at the end of the day, do we really need another Snow White adaptation, especially a live action remake of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? I I'm sorry, but honestly, considering the track record of all these Disney live action remakes, I'm not really that enthusiastic, especially like if we are going to go in the direction of adapting like the stuff by Walt Disney himself, like the ones that Walt Disney himself has actually produced so far. Those are the full on weakest, like the worst of the worst of the Disney live action remakes. It has to be Maleficent and especially Dumbo. Oh man, Dumbo was just embarrassingly bad. And that's an example of like, yeah, you know, it's a lot more different than what we got in the animated film, but the changes that they've made, oof, it, it was just garbage. And so from there, from the past experiences, I just don't necessarily have any high hopes for this one in particular. Now, granted, actually, I might take that back because um, just recently we did have Cruella and that one I would say is actually one of the better Disney live action remakes. Sure, I mean, it has a lot of very stupid moments, especially with the infamous uh, dogs killing Cruella's mom scene at the beginning. 
But still, though, uh, it's one of those uh, movie. You know, but still, though, like I, I would say with Corella, it's it's still one of the better ones. It still managed to stand well on its own for what it's trying to do. But the rest, though, it does not give me any hope. And even with this one, yeah, I don't think so. And I feel like it's one of those cases where, like, yeah, like, it, it, it's starting to become a bit more trouble than it's worth. Like, yeah, it's going to fall into all these controversies of, like, representation and stuff like that. And all in my mind, I was thinking, you know, it, it could all be easily avoidable if you just not make this movie. If you just don't make the movie at all. And I mean, like... Yeah, they got some incredible talents like Gal Gadot and uh, Rachel Zegler, but still, though, it's just... No, no thanks, guys. It's just... I, I, I don't want this. I don't really want a live-action remake of Snow White, especially when, like... I already got this. You know, like, thanks, guys, but I, I, I just want this. I literally want this. If you can re... You know, if you're gonna literally re-release this on the big screen... That I would definitely be down, but for like a live action remake, I, I don't want that, honestly. That just makes no sense. It's just, no, no thanks, Disney. It's just really, I, I, I feel like this is a controversy where like, it's more trouble than it's worth because it's a live action remake. All right, so that should be my little piece on that. And now I would like to go and ask the uh, chat wall over here, what do you all think of Peter Dinklage's comment of the uh, Snow White live action remake? And how do you feel about how this live action remake of Snow White is going to be? Do you think this is going to be uh, a great film? Do you think it could actually work out? Do you think the changes might be beneficial to this? Or do you think this movie would just be overall problematic? Let me know what you all think. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Let's see. What comments do we have here? If Disney wanted to adapt one of its classics into live action, how about reworking the Black Cauldron? Instead of cramming all the books in one movie, how about a few movies or series based on the Prydain Chronicles in a live action CGI setting? If not, bring back Tim Burton and make it stop motion uh, first for Disney. That would be a more appreciable, uh, more yeah, more appreciable than all that jibber jabber about Snow Pale and the Seven Blanks. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say this honestly. When it comes, like, I get why people want to say like, "Oh, want to make a, an adaptation on some of their more flawed movies, like The Black Cauldron or Atlantis: Lost Empire." But the thing is, is that Disney wants to go and adapt the ones that are like really popular because those are the ones that would end up becoming more, more the most profitable case in point look at the box office results of uh, aladdin beauty and the beast and especially the lion king remake so from there it's hard to really imagine that disney would go and legitimately do so with stuff like atlantis or the black cauldron I'm not saying they're bad ideas, but I just don't think Disney would do it because it wouldn't be that profitable of an idea. But actually, come to think of it, I you know, honestly, like when it comes to like a remake of The Black Cauldron, I, I just like this just popped in my mind. But imagine this, like instead of actually doing a live, you know, a live action remake or, what, or whatever, I could totally see Disney do a live action series like, based on all the Chronicles of Prydain books, and they could take elements from the Black Cauldron to go and adapt these stories. Like, you know, like, not not just go and, like, make all, all this major one big shot with one movie and that's it. Like, actually go and produce a full-on series for Disney+. Plus. Now, that could be something that would be more worthwhile and something that could really make the most with the materials that they have with all the so with all the sources that they could use on the entire Chronicles of Prydain series. I think that may have a bit more potential. Uh, let's see what other uh, comments that we what that we uh, do have here. Ah, there we go. While I like the idea of Disney remakes taking different approaches, the changes here, not gonna lie, if they find a way to pull it off and make them entertaining, it'll be uh I'll be down for this. Even if the film itself doesn't look interesting, 
even if Rachel Zegler is a proper star in the making. But to be honest, the best aspect of this section isn't that they're changing the doors. The best part is that Matt finally said Gal Gadot right. <laughs> I know, I know, but <laughs> I, I I got, you know, I I had some training. I had some, you know, like I know I know in the past I, I said like Gal got it a lot or something like that, but yeah, I know it's Gal Gadot. Like I, I got it in my head. I've seen enough videos where people say Gal Gadot, so I I I know. I know, guys. <laughs> okay, I got it right. So Anyways, uh, moving right along, I'm only watching this new Snow White film because of Rachel Zegler, and that's it. Everything else is definitely unnecessary, just like the previous Disney remakes. What would they use as the side characters? I don't know, but if they're going to use dwarves, please use real ones to hire or, or hire Peter Dinklage as one of them. Well, I don't think Peter Dinklage will be involved with this, so uh, I could gu guarantee you that. We need more diversity in everything. Overall, it's definitely a wait and see thing on what happens on this new Snow White film. Exactly. And maybe the changes are definitely going to be for the better or the changes might end up becoming a whole lot worse like what happened with Dumbo. Like ultimately, it is true that the only thing we can do is just wait and see to see if what Disney can do with this could actually turn out for the better or if it could actually work in the first place. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, I never cared about Disney live action remakes and I probably never will, but I do agree that Disney is a company that doesn't care about prog uh, progressivism and only cares about profit, which is the worst kind of progressivism. Lefties hate it because it's disingenuous and the righties hate it because they don't like progressivism. Yeah, that it really is kind of a you know, it really is kind of like a controversial thing with how Disney is handling being progressive and being uh, like in inclusive and stuff like that. But again, the thing is like, yeah, in, in terms of like the liberals and the lefties and stuff like that, like for them, they don't necessarily like it. But they do allow it because it's still better than the alternative. It's better for them to be inclusive, even with questionable uh, motives, than it is to be against it. So at least it's like they kind of it's like having an ally for all the wrong reasons, you know, like I, like at the end of the day. They still do have a very powerful ally with Disney because they recognize that being woke is a lot more profitable than to not be woke. So, you know, it, it's been like Disney is one of the greatest examples out there of how the go woke, go broke uh, motto is just a flat out lie and that only idiots would unironically believe that. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, who else do we have? Ah, OK, I'll go here. Hearing about how some Disney fans took offense to what Peter said just reminds me of why I'm not truly devoted of any fandom. I can easily see where Peter is coming from with his comments and how people see other people with dwarfism. As for the remake itself, it's a Disney live action remake, so I'm not expecting much. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think King right over here, he had like, I think he's the one who said it best. Like, basically... It's, be it's best not to be a part of, like, any fandom, period. Like, just enjoy the things that you actually like. You know, like, you could say that you're a Disney fan or whatever without being involved heavily with the Disney community. Or you could be a Star Wars fan without being heavily involved with the Star Wars community. Even even if you do like the, 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 se the, the, the sequel trilogy, like, even if you actually do like movies like The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and yes, even The Rise of Skywalker, you are still considered a Star Wars fan, no different than the fanboys that are in the fan fandom community that may not like those sequel trilogies. So I'm just saying, like, others don't like others are not the ones that could tell you if you are a specific fan or not. Only you are respond. Only you have the power to say if you are a fan of something or not. So I just want to go and uh, state that right there. Uh, let's see. I admire Peter Dinklage as an actor in movies and shows such as Game of Thrones, Elf, and Narnia 2, and even in animated movies such as the Angry Birds movies. For this one, I agree with him since dwarves themselves feel underappreciated in movies despite having some cool moments like Lord of the Rings, for example. Even though I don't trust Disney in making live-action remakes like Snow White, for example, there have been some changes regarding uh, the dwarves' involvement. 
Yeah, and I think that's going to be the big... The, I think now it's this is going to be the, the ultimate wait and see kind of thing. Like, what are they going to do to the dwarves? Because at this point, it is guaranteed that they are not going to be the same as how they were in the 1937 movie. So, like, I, I think that's going to be the big moment where everybody needs to pay attention to. What are they going to do with the dwarves? Are they even going to be dwarves? Let's just wait and see what happens. All right, I'll read one more comment before we move on to the um, next story. Uh, let's see, who do we have here? Yeah, I'll, I might as well go with this one. I do have to agree with Peter Dinklage. Sometimes people take dwarfism uh, way too seriously, but luckily Disney has his back. I wonder how Disney is going to handle with this adaptation of Snow White. Maybe they might take this reboot into a serious turn, or maybe it's going to go dark like the original story. Uh, a bit too late for that because, well, Mirror Mirror and Snow White and the Huntsman have already done those things. Uh, but anyways, uh, but I wouldn't have it go in that direction. Snow White and the Seven Doors was one of Disney's timeless masterpieces, and making another adaptation into this would be impossible to make. Also, who would Peter play? Okay, I've already I've already said before that Peter Dinklage is not going to be a part of this movie. But you know what? You know, I, I, I just got this crazy idea, actually. Okay, imagine this. How about, the, like, yes, we will have Peter Dinklage in this movie. Let's actually cast him in this. Now, who do you think he's going to play? He's going to play Doc. He's going to play Grumpy. He's going to play Dopey. He's going to play, he's going to play uh, Bashful, Sneezy, uh, Happy, or Sleepy. No, none of those. He's going to play the prince. I would, you know, honestly, I would do a total three, you know, I would do like a total 180 on this. Have the doors be played like Adam Sandler's Happy Madison crew. Like get Adam Sandler's gang to play the dwarves the same height as always, or just or like even just shrink them down a little bit, but have Peter Dinklage play as the prince. Like that would be true justice for dwarves everywhere. Like it's gonna be like the prince is going to be the real dwarf, but all the other but the the seven legit dwarves are just going to be regular sized dudes. Just like Adam Sandler, Kevin James, Chris Rock, uh, David Spade, Steve Buscemi, and all those guys. I think, like, at least you'll have the comedy, like, set itself right there. And, and I think, like, that whole aspect could really write itself. Oh, man, that would actually be beautiful. Like, really, if we're going to have Peter Dinklage, it's like, he's going to be the prince. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say on that. <laughs> Okay, now, on the next controversy that we are going to be diving right into, this is just an appetizer in terms of the kind of controversy that Disney got themselves in. Or at the very least, the kind that the media tells you that Disney has themselves in, because uh, the thing is, is that what you read on the internet may not necessarily be true compared to what happened in real life or the perspective that people actually do have and with that said we're gonna get into this one folks let's go and talk about Minnie Mouse oh yes we're diving into this one for sure so you probably have heard oh sorry folks I just wanted to um uh, just wanted to open up uh, a, an image just to give you a, a clearer idea of what I am talking about here. So, uh, yep, here we go. This is the mini that I am talking about. So, you probably have heard about this new costume that Minnie Mouse has received. And to give you all the full context of what is going on, um, maybe you have heard that this year in 2022, Disneyland Paris is going to be celebrating their 30th anniversary. And that honestly is a thought that really does scare me because of the fact that Disneyland Paris opened in 1992, which means that in several months from now, I'm going to be 30 years old. Like, holy crap, I, you know, I, I've been in my 20s for so long, like, I, I don't know if I'm ready to go into that big next step. It kind of scares me a little bit. <laughs> nah, but uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, Disneyland, yes, yeah, so Disneyland Paris is going to be celebrating their 30th anniversary. And from there, 
Um, as you could probably imagine, like they usually do with big anniversaries for their theme parks, they would go and have brand new costumes for the main Disney characters like Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, Pluto, Donald, Daisy, and uh, the, the entire Disney gang. And this is the costumes that they have so far. So you see, like, um, it's something that can be best described as uh, as something that is like part fancy and part something that would come out of Tomorrowland, where you see Mickey all in blue, like with this um, very like kind of baggy but futuristic kind of clothing. Uh, well, kind of like a blue and purple mix and uh, a transparent top hat. And you also got Minnie here where um, she kind of has like this astro themed pink dress going on with a with a, a different kind of a transparent top hat. But these aren't the costumes that I'm talking about. These are just going to be the costumes that will regularly be the 30th anniversary theme for um, Disneyland Paris's anniversary. Now, what I'm talking about specifically is going to be this special edition costume that Disney actually has over here. Now, this one is actually a lot more different, where this one is going to be commemorating not just the 30th anniversary of Disneyland Paris, but also is going to be celebrating International Women's Day. And this is actually a costume that is designed by Stella McCarthy, the famous British fashion designer. And uh, as you can see, this one is uh, a lot more different than Minnie Mouse's usual gear, where um, the, the best way that I could describe it is that Minnie Mouse is dressed up like a boss. And I don't necessarily mean like, yo, Minnie Mouse is being a boss, yo. No, it's not that. I mean literally dressed up like an executive or she is ready to represent her client in court. Like that kind of boss where she's dressed more like an executive, like with the suit, she's wearing pants. And of course, like to add that feminine touch, like there are little black bow ties on her suit and she also is wearing a bow tie and uh not to mention also that um the the the, the entire costume itself is in dark blue and it has uh polka dots everywhere like Minnie usually would have with her red dress but it's uh it's black and blue instead of being red and white so that's kind of the big thing that's going on with Minnie in fact let me go into a uh, uh, specifics uh coming from my source here on CNN, where it states, um, uh, would it be, yeah, okay, no, it would be from here. So it says here, for the first time in her nearly century long life, Minnie Mouse will add a pantsuit to her wardrobe. And it won't be just any old pair of uh, uh, tailored slacks, but an iconic silhouette from British fashion designer Stella, McCart uh, Stella McCartney. Through a sneak, uh, though a sneak peek of Minnie's new sartorial statement hit the internet early, her full makeover will be unveiled in March to commemorate two different dates, International Women's Day and the 30th anniversary of Disneyland Paris. A press statement about the project says McCartney was chosen to create the look because of her legacy of female leadership as well as her commitment to uh, sustainability. So that's the big thing that we got right here with uh, Minnie Mouse. The fact that uh, for Disneyland Paris's 30th anniversary, they're going to give Minnie Mouse a bit of a new look that's most likely going to be for the sake of uh, merchandising. I'm not 100% sure if they will do like a mean greet version of this Minnie Mouse. Maybe they will, but um, ultimately we will have to wait and see. But we know that apparently this is going to be a Minnie Mouse that's coming soon. However... Here's the part where it gets a bit interesting and it gets, well, very twisted. Because the thing is, a lot of people seem to think that, like, a lot of people don't necessarily have the entire context that this is for Disneyland Paris's 30th anniversary. Or that this is just going to be a Disneyland Paris thing that's only going to be happening in that little section of Europe. Because the way the media presented this, 
they, they have a, pr a pretty unique statement and you will see like throughout different headlines they all share a bit of a similar theme so let's actually go and um, look at this one by one so this is on Google and I just wrote down Minnie Mouse pantsuit and I'm in the news section so you'll see all the titles and all the different headlines that they have and the way that they frame it is a little bit interesting CNN Minnie Mouse is trading her iconic red dress for a new look BBC Disney Minnie Mouse to swap her dress for a trouser suit uh, we also got the Atlanta Journal Constitution all the rage Minnie Mouse pantsuit sparks uproar with some fans Daily Mail Disney sparks outrage after debuting look for Minnie Mouse with progressive blue pantsuit New York Post Minnie Mouse is ditching her iconic red dress for a pantsuit basically it's all trying to say like with these kinds of headlines they're stating that apparently Minnie Mouse is getting rid of all of her f f iconic red dress in favor of that pantsuit apparently this is going to be the new Minnie Mouse forever that's basically how the title is describing it manipulative oh absolutely and like you could see that like this is from all the media that is doing it like even the ones that are often said to be a bit more unbiased such as uh, CNN or BBC and uh, uh, like all, all like and a few others as well but it's especially from right wing news reports like um, the Daily Mail or the New York Post that they would go and frame this as like uh, this new progressive suit that Minnie Mouse has and that she's never going to wear her red suit ever again. And you would see on, on right-wing media that they would spark outrage on this, that they would get angry and, and they would like scold Disney and demonize them for this change, which is the case of what Fox News did. Uh, yeah, of what Fox News did as they brought on board Candace Owens to go and comment on this, where not only did she comment that now with her pantsuit, Minnie Mouse looks masculine, but she also stated this. Uh, hold on, Twitter needs to upload a bit. So there we go, yeah. Apparently Candace had to say this, if there is sound. Okay, there we go. I mean, look, this is why people don't take these people seriously. They're taking all of these things that nobody was offended by. It's like they have to get rid of them and destroy them because they're bored. You know, they're absolutely bored. They're trying to destroy fabrics of our society, pretending that there's issues. So everybody looks over here. Look at Minnie Mouse. Don't look at inflation, Jesse. Look at Minnie Mouse. The world is going forward yep. because you've got her in a pantsuit. Never mind that you can't get anything at the grocery store and you can't buy a piece of bacon unless you've got $30 in your pocket. At least we're addressing the real problem, which is yeah. Minnie Mouse. That's right. I mean, like projection much, Candace? I mean, freaking seriously. Like, isn't that what you're literally doing right now? That, like, because you're ignoring people of what the real issue is, and now you're going after Minnie Mouse because of her new pantsuit and making like ridiculous claims such as destroying the fabric of our society. Uh, so, so that's pretty much the big thing that is going on right now. The fact that the media is taking this new look that Minnie Mouse is having, this temporary new look that's going on at Disneyland Paris and pretty much framing it as if Disney is ditching the famous red dress in favor of having this pantsuit. And that's currently what is going on. And uh, before I do begin, I, I just wanna go and give you guys a little bit of a history lesson because technically, this is not the first time that we have seen Minnie Mouse wear pants. I mean, yeah, like they are very rare when that actually does happen. But technically, Minnie has legit worn pants before where instead of having like a dress or a skirt, she would legit wear pants and in official Disney licensed things as well. And probably one of the most famous examples that you have probably seen on social media get shared again and again, it would probably be back in the mid to late 1980s with the whole totally mini campaign where Disney decided that 
In order to bring back the popularity of Mini, they would do this entire thing called Totally Mini, which would bring Minnie Mouse back to the mainstream and bring her back in a way that feels very current at the time. That Minnie is now like Minnie is like new and hip, and she understands like the world that's going on right now. So from there, they would go and make um, Totally Mini like albums or like they they would have a totally mini album which even includes a song that is called totally mini uh at disneyland there was even a whole parade dedicated to uh the totally mini trend and have mini be all decorated in 80s and stuff like that and in 1988 there was actually a tv special of uh totally mini where we see this like weird plot line that's going out or that that's going on with a bunch of live action people and this animated Minnie Mouse would come in to go and help this one weird guy out. And I actually do have a clip here, and you'll see this is the iconic fashion trend that Minnie had during the whole uh, Totally Minnie fad. Minnie! Oh, well, <laughs> so much for special effects! <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe it, and nobody like me, I actually get to meet Minnie Mouse! Relax, I used to think I was a nobody too, watch this! So that's just one thing I wanted to show you is the fact that Minnie, as you can see here, she was legit wearing pants. Like, yeah, she's got like this pink uh, sweat. You know, she got kind of like this pink jacket going on. Uh, she's more decorated in yellow. Like now she has a yellow bow tie, but she has blue pants. We see her actually wearing pants. And that's not the only time either. And I mean, there are probably a few bits of obscure, like, merchandising or, like, random pictures where we do see Minnie wearing pants. But another prominent example was actually something that recently happened back in 2019, where on the Disney Cruise Line, Minnie actually ditched the skirt that she would usually wear in favor of having pants. This is the new Minnie Mouse mascot would go, uh, who would go and walk around the Disney Cruise Line. And as you can see here, she's not wearing a skirt. She is legit wearing pants. So there have been some instances where technically, and, 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 and again, by the way, this is like a, this would count as a pants suit where like Minnie is dressed up like a legit captain where she is ready to work. So this is all to just clarify that there have been instances where Minnie actually did ditch the red dress in favor of actually wearing comfortable pants or wear, wear some legit working pants. So it's not the first time that this actually happened. But with that said, though, my God, this really does feel like the true definition of false outrage. Like, I'm not really buying for a second that this really is something that people are legitimately outraged by. Like, honestly, I remember back like a few weeks ago when I talked about last year with the whole like can uh, the whole cancel culture thing and how a lot of it is nothing more but the media, especially right wing media, creating false outrage for the desperate attempt in order to get clicks, to get attention, to get views and all that kind of stuff. And that's the feeling that I'm also getting right over here because really it's one of those situations where you have to think are people really upset of the fact that Minnie Mouse is wearing pants like that's the thing right now that people are getting upset over I mean there are tons of problems that are going on in the real world and the thing that that's really grinding your gears right now is the fact that Minnie Mouse is wearing pants? No, I'm not buying it. And the, yeah, like there are probably some articles out there that says that, oh, people are outraged, but I can guarantee you the grand majority of people are absolutely not. I'm not even buying the fact that most conservatives would be upset about it. I'm even sure that the grand majority of those people are not even buying into this. Like they see Minnie Mouse wearing pants and they're like, eh, okay, whatever. It just feels like something that they that 
a lot of right-wing media, such as New York Post and Fox News, that they want to try to fabricate in order to say, like, oh, look at what woke culture is doing. And it's not just right-wing media either. Like, even, like, the ones in the center and in the left. I just showed you, like, even, um, e e even the BBC and CNN are also guilty of trying to do these desperate clickbait tactics as well. Because that's all it is. It's in order to get clickbait. It, it, it's in order to get clicks, to get attention, to get views and all that kind of stuff, to create this false outrage in the hopes that there's some stupid idiot online that they'll believe this, get emotionally invested, and they will share their link to show to for them to go and express uh, express their outrage. That's the big thing that's going on with this. And really, like, again, the big thing that you're being outraged here is what? Minnie Mouse is wearing different pants and specifically that Minnie Mouse is going to be wearing a suit at Disneyland Paris. This isn't something that's going to be global. This isn't something that's going to be like on TV or like it's going to be like on a brand new series. It's just going to be for that one specific area in Europe and that's it. It's not happening at Disneyland. It's not happening at Disney World. It's just going to be at Disneyland Paris. And that's it. Not to mention the fact that this is obviously one of those things that if you are unironically outraged over this, then honestly, it says a lot more about you than it says about the problem that you claim that it is. Like, it really does. Because... Think back, like, not long ago, probably last week or something, you probably remember when Tucker Carlson made that huge, massive rant about the M&Ms, and they had a bit of a new design where they got new shoes, especially with the green M&M. Now, granted, that whole controversy with the M&Ms, that's nothing more but a distraction because the parent company, Mars, is uh, one of the many companies that is actually being sued for child labor, but that's kind of a whole different story right there but the point is with tucker carlson he just went on this massive rant that he is so severely upset of the changes that they have made especially with the green m&m instead of wearing sexy boots she would wear sneakers and that completely backfired on the dude mainly because of how many memes and how many posts that people have done making fun of tucker carlson because it really did make him look like he has always been so horny for the green M&M, and now he's just so emotionally upset and so emotionally invested of the fact that they change the character design where she's not as sexy, and thus that makes her a bit more progressive and woke or whatever. Like, really, it's one of those things that if you unironically are angry at that kind of character design, again, it says a lot about you than it does about the subject itself, and it will raise a lot of questions. And it's the same thing with what's going on with Minnie Mouse. Like, why would you really be upset of the fact that she's no longer wearing a dress and that she's wearing pants? And this is especially the case when it comes to Candace Owens. The fact that she would go on this complete unhinged rant and would say these ridiculous things like destroying the fabrics of our society and that, oh, Minnie Mouse looks more masculine. Girl, let me tell you, you look more masculine. Like, no joke, the facial features that she has, she looks a bit more like a man. So she can't really speak for, like, oh, what is considered to be feminine or stuff like that. I know, it, like, it might be very offensive, but I'm just saying that she ain't freaking, you know, she ain't freaking uh, Aphrodite herself over here. So, and the thing is, is that, like, really, with her being so upset about like Minnie Mouse changing her costume and that apparently it's destroying the fabrics of our society. Again, like I've already talked about Candace Owens before and like the type of unhinged rants that she would do. And I could uh, like, and I could safely assure you that I feel like there's a 99% chance that when it comes to Candace Owens, she's a grifter. She doesn't even believe in half of the things that she says. I wouldn't be surprised if she would come out as like, it turns out she's a legitimate liberal who voted for Joe Biden. 
Like, I know that might sound crazy, but it would not shock me whatsoever because she doesn't even believe even a fraction of the things she says. If she unironically believes what she actually says, she is mentally unstable. She would need to go to an asylum. She is, like, purely crazy and really highly dangerous, especially to herself. And especially trying to make these unhinged rants, again, it's something that really does say a lot more about her than it does about the whole Minnie Mouse thing that is going on. Like, where really she's just trying to desperately fabricate outrage, she's desperate to try to get attention, even if it's gonna make her look absolutely insane and completely mentally unstable. Like, that's where, that that's the point where she's pretty much at. She's just so desperate for attention that she would just fabricate any kind of culture war, uh, like, wh whatever she may find. Like, even if she would have to scrape the bottom of the barrel to find something like this, to find, like, the, the whole Mickey Mouse, uh, the whole Minnie Mouse controversy, or, like, with the whole Minnie Mouse wearing a suit. It, it, it's ridiculous. Now, keep in mind, I just want to say that Maybe there are a few people out there, but like it's a very small minority. Like I like even myself. I have actually seen on social media a handful of people that did unironically get upset. And again, it does make them look completely stupid. Like I even saw one comment on um, on Facebook, I think, where there's this one guy who like went on this unhinged rant. This rant, it's like, oh, Disney is being woke again. What the hell? Why give Minnie pants? What's next? Are they gonna make Minnie trans? And like it, and, and like I double checked, and yes, it was like an unironic tweet. Like it, it's one of those comments that you think it would be a parody, but it's not really. And again, and. I want to emphasize again, if P if you see someone who is unironically upset about the way Minnie is dressed in that kind of thing, then it says a lot more about them than it does about the Minnie Mouse subject. And I'm just going to give you all a warning. If you ever see a person, no matter who they are, that if they get so emotionally upset of the fact that Minnie is wearing pants instead of her iconic red dress... Don't ever date them because there's a 99.9% .9 chance that they are domestic abusers. That if they think they could be so commanding and that they are this unhinged over something like Minnie Mouse changing costumes, then you can imagine what they would do to their spouse. So I'm just laying that warning right there. But my point is... The grand, when it comes to the grand majority of people, even when it comes to like the grand majority of conservatives that people may think would be upset about this, it's just not true. And I really feel like this is just the media really fabricating the, like they're the ones who are fabricating this outrage for the sake of getting attention and for the sake of getting clicks in order to spark this cult, like this false culture war and really making this mountain out of a molehill. When at the end of the day, it's just Minnie Mouse wearing a dress and that's it. Like we don't even know the full context of like what it's for. Is she, is there going to be like a meet and greet costume where we meet her? Is this just going to be for merchandising purposes? We don't know, but all we do know is that this is going to be a Disneyland Paris exclusive and that's it. And especially when it comes to people like Candace Owens, who wants to go and put her note or like, right, like, especially when it comes to like right wing media or Candace Owens putting their nose on, on this and really like going on unhinged rants about it. Let me just say this. That aspect really does piss me off because as a Canadian myself, whenever I would go and make commentary about whenever I would make uh, criticism regarding uh, social uh, social subject matter or even when it comes to like uh, political subject matter, I would always get like these nationalist idiots coming in and tell me, you should talk about politics. You're Canadian. You don't understand what I'm America is doing it, 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 it. And yet here they are, those same kind of idiots going after something that's only happening in freaking Europe. Like they're the ones who are allowed to comment whatever is happening both in the United States and around the world. But apparently, oh, I can't comment because I'm Canadian. And apparently Canada is a completely different world than in the United States. And thus I can't comment on it because it, like, 
it, I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Like, shut the hell up. And to Candace Owens and to Fox News and to right-wing media who would do this kind of crap and rant about stuff like this, how about freaking keep your damn politics out of this, okay? This doesn't concern you. This is a European thing. So you know what? Just shut up and keep your politics out of the damn situation because you're only going to make things worse and you're just using it in order to advance your delusional nationalist agenda. So shut the hell up, man. No one wants to hear your damn psychotic politics. Seriously, I, I just needed to go and, and say that because honestly, like people who keep telling me that are, are just absolutely hypocritical. And I know what I'm saying. Like, I know the things that I say. I know that I'm smart, man. I know of what I am freaking talking about. I don't need some psychotic Trump supporter to tell me otherwise when they're going to be going around like spreading their delusional conspiracy theories and praising Donald Trump as he's freaking Hitler. Okay, I don't need that crap. So yeah, overall though, like with this whole damn thing with Minnie, I don't believe for a sec that this is a real controversy. This is a controversy that is fabricated by the media just for the sake of getting clicks. But regardless of whatever opinion you may have regarding the dress itself, honestly, I just like I don't care because it's like it's it's a thing that Disney usually does all the time by giving their main characters like Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, Pluto, Donald and whatever. Like they would give them like these different types of costumes and they could be a bit more different than what they would usually wear. So, you know what? I just don't care, really. It, it's just ridiculous. I, I, I feel like it's something that needs to be called out, that this is nothing but false outrage, and there are much more important things in the world to worry about instead of stuff like this. So I just need to go and uh, comment on that. Okay, but with that said, though, I would like to go and um, go to the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about this whole situation of Minnie Mouse wearing a red dress or no no well how do you feel about Minnie wearing this new dr this new suit for Disneyland Paris do you believe in the outrage it's actually real do you think it's fabricated by the media let me know what you think on all this oh <laughs> uh, let's see Candace is a stupid moron and, and with an ugly face and her butt smells and she likes to kiss her own butt. <laughs> uh, that, that sounds familiar, actually. Like, oh, I, for, I forgot the reference, but it's like, I know, I know I've heard this before. But anyways, Candace, you stupid idiot. Re you really are the stupidest person I've ever seen. You think everyone is laughing at you? No. Uh, or is laughing with you? No. Everyone is laughing at you. Jesus Christ, she's so delusional. Anyways... Minnie looks nice with those new pants. I wish they have done it more in the Disney parks. Hopefully we can, we do get pants mini at Disneyland in SoCal soon. Uh, I would like that. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. I've said this a million, uh, a million times, but conservatives can let, uh, call the left soft when they're offended by gingerbread cookies, M&Ms, then the Muppets and now Minnie Mouse. Well, not necessarily. Because the media, like, as I'm saying, the media wants you to think that they are upset over the Minnie Mouse thing, but it's may, but it's most likely not true. Uh, yeah, who's the soft one here? Hell, uh, it doesn't help that uh, all this is such a non-controversy, a non-troversy, if you will. But you want to know the real hypocrisy of the right-wing media getting mad over this? Candace Owens got mad at Minnie wearing a pantsuit while wearing a pantsuit. Let that sink in. And that is true that, you know, and that's the funny thing with uh, like, that's the funny thing with Candace Owens, because like often she has been called out to being self-loathing and that, it, you know, and when you look into the psychology of this, there is like some truth to that basis where a lot of the rants that she would do and a lot of the attacks that she has done, it's basically a bit of self-projecting because of how much she hates herself. And the only way that she could go and like, Matt, you know, try to escape from the fact that she absolutely hates herself is the fact 
that she would go and like go on these unhinged nationalistic rants where she would go absolutely berserk even for stuff like mini for like mini mouse wearing pants and i mean i'm sure on several occasions that candace herself would actually wear pants suits and maybe she looks like absolute crap with it or she herself thinks that she looks terrible in pants suits so that's why she would let out her self-loathing onto Minnie Mouse. And that could actually be, that, that could have some merit. That could have some truth onto that. Well, let's see. This is one of the most bullshit non-controversies I've ever seen. I thought Harry Styles wearing a dress was the destruction of society. I thought trans people being accepted with this was the destruction of society. I thought Tucker Carlson being unable to jerk off to an M&M was the destruction of society. This happens every week. You should make a cancel culture panic button on your soundboard. Yeah, it's like every time there's a cancel cult, it's like, oh, cancel culture time. <laughs> Watch out, everybody. There's cancel culture. Oops, I dropped my pencil. Oh, I guess the pencil is canceled. <laughs> yeah, we should go into. Yeah, just ha like have a cancel culture button for everything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, did you get called out for something? There's a cancel culture button for that. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Let's see what we have here. To be honest, I'm very cool with Minnie's pantsuit, and she looks very hot and style uh, stylish in that. And I love the color blue in it. But in all seriousness, right-wing media is uh, taking it, taking way too far with this whole thing, especially Candace Owens. Uh, it's only a pantsuit for International Women's Day and Disneyland Paris' 30th anniversary. No wonder why people are so outraged that Minnie will be in that pantsuit forever. If we if we were if we were to meet Candace Owens, I would just tell her to shut the f up and take a chill pill. Well, yeah. Well, keep in mind again, this is not just right wing media. This is media in general that's doing this. It's anyone and any everyone trying to go and make desperate clickbait. And keep in mind, though, I wouldn't say it's necessarily everyone per se, because there are a few that actually are being honest. Like, believe it or not, People Magazine actually did get or are actually pretty upfront uh with their headline where they said Minnie Mouse to wear a pantsuit for the first time in history for Disneyland Paris's 30th anniversary. And that's kind of the big thing that like they did emphasize is that they add the fact that it's for Disneyland Paris, not that something that not many are actually describing here. Or even another one I think I saw. Ah, oh, crap. No, screw this. I don't even. Oh my god, no. I don't want to do this. I'm I don't want to do the recapture bull crap. Oh my god, I hate these things. I swear. They could be so annoying at times, but you get the point I'm making here. It's the fact that when it comes to the media, like they're the ones responsible, like conservative or even liberal they can go and be guilty of making these desperate clickbait garbage. Let's see. So, they're freaking out over a temporary outfit change. Lord Almighty, it's a freaking outfit change. It's not even a good outfit change. The color and outfit is fine, it's just the polka dots look bad. Polka dots are really hard to pull off in general, and it doesn't work here. But generally speaking, pants do not make the person more masculine, and a woman wearing a dress is not an issue. This is not a major gender role changing thing, it's just an outfit change for only a celebration. Like, yeah, and, and seriously, this is one thing that I just want to ask. Like, like for, for those few people that are really upset that Minnie Mouse is wearing pants, is Minnie Mouse not allowed to wear pants? Like what? Like what's next? Do you think Minnie Mouse would be too woke if she would go and vote? Just because she's a character from the 1920s, that doesn't mean she would have to continuously live by the rules of the 1920s. That's all I'm saying. All right, I think I'm going to go and read uh, one more comment uh, before we move on. Uh, let's see. Is this what people are ranting about now? Pants. Well, not really, but the media wants to tell you that. I would say that I'm shocked, but considering how many dumb things people get, got seemingly mad over, I've become numb to any and all shock. This whole story is just people ranting about problems that doesn't even exist. As for Tucker Carlson, someone must have sent him. Someone must send him to horny jail as soon as possible. Give us some time, folks. Sooner or later, people will be mad about freaking breathing. I mean, you're not wrong there. I mean, I, you could debate that it's already happening because anti-woke people are so upset of the fact that trans people are breathing. 
or that women are breathing, black people are breathing. The fact that any not any non-white person is breathing, like they get triggered over. So there is that. All right, now we got one more controversy that we are about to get into. And this one, I will say, this is an actual problem. Now, this is a controversy that is legitimately concerning, and it is legitimate to get upset over, and that you should give backlash towards. Because this is something that, honestly, it's pretty frightening that someone would even think about doing so. And what I'm going to be talking about is regarding the mouse controversy. Now, for those of you who don't know what happened, uh, there's a school board in Tennessee, specifically the McMinn County School Board, uh, has sparked some massive outrage all around the world on the internet because they decided to go and ban the Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel Mouse by Art uh, Spiegelman. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mouse is basically uh, a very heartbreaking story where it pretty, the, the best way to describe it is that it tells you the story of the Holocaust from the perspective of a survivor, like someone who went through all the terrors and all the horrors of it and did manage to live to tell the tale. And it's just so heartbreaking. It, it's one of those that... Like you, do, it's one of those things that you don't want to read, but you should read because of how painful and how heartbreaking it is because it presents the whole truth about the Holocaust, about Nazis and the way that they would treat other people that are not them in order to fulfill like the whole master race uh, prodigy and stuff like that. And even though they would change, like, even though they would change some things where they would present the Jews as mice and the Nazis as cats, it is still something that it is very concerning. And the, the way they present it feels absolutely real. But anyways, apparently this, te this uh, Tennessee school board decided to go and ban it completely. Why? Well, I will go and um, read you here as to why specifically they have decided to go and uh, do so. I believe uh, they have. Yeah. OK, they have a, a statement over here in which it says, reading from my source here on CNBC, in a statement posted on its web on its website Thursday, after numerous media articles detailed the controversy, the McMinn County Board of Education said the board voted to remove the graphic novel Mouse from McMinn County Schools because of its unnecessary use of profanity and nudity and its depiction of violence and suicide. Taken as a whole, the board felt this whole uh, this work was simply too adult oriented for the use in our schools. And by the way, uh, I, like this isn't this isn't a book that normally they would give to like any children out there. It's not something like oh we need to keep it off of the hands of like preschoolers. Apparently they actually they actually had a specific grade of where they would want to have it, and even the article actually starts out by saying. A Tennessee school board has voted to remove the Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel Mouse from an 8th grade language arts curriculum due to the concerns about profanity and an image of female nudity in its depiction of Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust. So they just don't want 8th graders to go and read Mouse because, oh, it might be a little too profane for that. But from there, as you could probably imagine, this received so much backlash. This received so much hate across the internet. And even in, uh, Art Spiegel, uh, even Art Spiegel, Spie Spiegelman, yeah, even Art Spiegelman himself, like, was pretty shocked about this. And he even commented, like, what the hell? Why would you even do that? And um, the best way to describe it is that Neil Gaiman even commented and posted a, a very famous tweet uh, in which he states, there is only one kind of people who would vote to ban Mouse, whatever they are calling themselves these days. And one thing that a lot of people have pointed out um, is the fact that not just Tennessee, but specifically the McMinn, uh, the McMinn County 
is a deep red state. Like, it is very red to the point where they would continuously vote Republican ever since the year 2000. Like, even, like, in the 2020 election, the grand majority would actually vote for Donald Trump. So, already right there, it's a very bad look that a Trump-supporting county would go and ban a book about the horrors of the Holocaust. So you could probably imagine that, like, the people who decided to go and ban it, well, yeah, they are depicted, uh, how can I put this, the, the, they're pretty much viewed as the cats in Mouse. I'll just leave it at that. Now, the county would go and try to clarify that this is not the case, and that they still want to go and educate people about the horrors of the Holocaust. That um, apparently the school board actually did go out and uh, put out this statement where they say here that they do not um, that they do not diminish the value of Mouse as an impactful and meaningful piece of literature, nor do we dispute the importance of teaching our children the historical and moral lessons and realities of the Holocaust. To the contrary, we have asked our administrators to find other works that accomplish the same educational goals in a more age-appropriate fashion. The atrocities of the Holocaust were shameful beyond description, and we, ha and we all have an obligation to ensure that younger generations learn the horrors to ensure such an event is never repeated. Which I mean, nowadays... You know, like, ever since the Trump administration, we have slowly but surely seen more and more of that kind of history in particular being repeated. And this is all not to mention, by the way, that this is all happening right at the same time as conservatives are trying to go and manipulate the education, uh, the educational system to have it be more in their favor so that they would go and educate it, the educate children their way, which is why they want to go and put in bans such as uh, like making sure nobody learns about critical race theory. Like apparently this is the new enemy of conservatives. They don't want critical race theory to be taught in schools because they don't want to teach children about what happened to the slaves and they might get a little you know it might be too offensive and it might be too dangerous for them and all that kind of bullcrap but in reality we all know that the only people who want to go and ban critical race theory are the people that are viewed as the bad guys in critical race theory i'm just i'll, I'll go I'll, I'll continue this a little later but my point is, uh, with this whole story, is the fact that considering how Mouse has apparently been banned because of this uh, Tennessee school board, there have been some uh, consequences that are actually good, where because of this, Mount Mouse actually did become an Amazon bestseller. And I do encourage you to go and actually buy uh, a book of Mouse if you guys haven't yet. So that's pretty much the whole thing that's currently going on with this mouse controversy. And one thing that I will say about this, when I first heard about this, yeah, it is shocking. And like, like I know that technically the McMinn County School Board, they want to say that like, yeah, they under, like, you know, they're, you know, they're not on the side of the Nazis and they want to educate kids, but they don't want to go and present all the profanities and stuff like that. You know, honestly, it's like, okay, maybe you guys aren't like the cats and mouse, but you guys are absolute freaking idiots. Like, you're like inbred levels of absolutely stupid. Like, what do you want specifically? Like, do you want a disney version of the Holocaust to tell the kids to make it kid-friendly, to make it all nice and sparkly, that you don't have to go into the little details of the graphic things that did happen while presenting the horrors of the Holocaust? No, you can't do that. And especially for the reasons, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And what you're trying to say, it still doesn't give you a good image. The fact that you would rather not want to teach, like, the fact that you would rather not want to teach kids about the Holocaust because, oh, there might be some swear words, oh, there might be some private parts that are shown, I'd rather not have my little Timmy show any swear words or private parts than to teach them about the Holocaust. Like, really, it makes you 
petty. It makes you so weak and it makes you bad parents most of all that you're not even qualified to be raising children if you're going to be at that level of overprotectiveness that if you're going to be restricting them from having any form of knowledge especially if you're going to be banning if, especially if you're going to be at the levels of literally banning books that like really that's like a major red flag over there and i'm just going to say this right now like, if you really are going to go and ban Mouse for those reasons, because of the profanity, because of the gratuitous violence, because of the nudity and all that kind of stuff, if you want to go and ban Mouse for that, then you should ban the Bible. I'm, I'm not kidding. You should go and legit ban the Bible and make sure no kid would be anywhere near a Bible. Don't even go in a place where they have Bibles in the first place. Go and legit ban the Bible because if you have actually read the Bible, there are a lot of really messed up stories. Like it ain't just like pretty little moments of what happened to Jesus Christ and all his fun little miracles. No, there have been some messed up scenarios that does involve nudity, that does involve adultery, that does involve like massive violence. Even with Jesus himself, his journey of going into the cross ain't a pretty sight. And there probably have been a few profanities here and there, but the point is, is that, yeah, the Bible is also a really messed up book that technically, by your logic that you're presenting, children should not even be involved with. So really, if you're going to go that far to ban Mouse for those reasons, then you should legit ban the Bible for that as well. If not, then that would go and immediately make you an absolute hypocrite. And that's, and again, like the timing of this is indeed absolutely poor because of what we are seeing right now with how conservatives are desperately trying to manipulate the educational system to be more in their favor because they're too scared to tell kids that racism is bad. Like that's really like they may have like whatever dumbass reason about why they don't want to educate kids about critical race theory because like oh it's too offensive oh it's too bru it's too sad to hear oh I don't want to hurt people's feelings when talking about critical race theory no we all know very well why people would want to go and ban critical race theory and that is because it makes racism the bad guys like there's no white savior in the story in fact. It's actually white Americans with the same viewpoints as the modern conservatives today that they are viewed as the bad guys in all these stories. That it's white Americans that took black people from Africa and placed them in America to become slaves. It's those white Americans that would be whipping the slaves as they would do their work. It's those white Americans with conservative be beliefs and, cons and well, not conservative, well, with um, Confederate, I, I mean more uh, with, it's those white Americans with Confederate beliefs that are opposed to Abraham Lincoln freeing the slaves. It's those white Americans with the same kind of fears of communism that oppose Martin Luther King Jr. and and portrayed his, his protests as highly violent the same way that we see people saying that, oh, Black Lives Matter is so violent and whatever. It's those white Americans that are viewed as the bad guys in their stories. It, it, well, in the stories of critical race theory. And that's why they want to go and ban them. And I mean, they're not hiding the fact that it really is because they favor feelings over facts. In fact, in Florida right now, they just recently put up a bill that literally actually shields white sensitivity that 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 apparently the work that workforces and for schools they actually made it illegal to actually educate something or actually make it an offense if white people have their feelings hurt or if white people end up feeling like uncomfortable or offended they literally made a bill of feelings over facts are you freaking kidding me and, and people wonder why Florida is often viewed as just deranged psychopaths because there's literally a deranged psychopath that is leading with Ron DeSaints. Like, seriously, it, it, it's honestly ridiculous 
of what is currently going on with the way that they're trying to manipulate it. So now it's not the time to go and pull a move where you want to go and get rid of mouse. Because the thing is, if you're going to be getting, if you want to go and ban books like mouse at the same time as the whole war on critical race theory is going on, then of course there are going to be people who will assume that you want to ban mouse for the same reason why racist people want to ban cr critical race theory. So there is that bad imagery that will come with it. But there's also one more thing that I personally find to be very dangerous, that I find to be so horrific. I think, honestly, this is the worst part of it all with this whole mouse controversy. It's the fact that even with all this happening, even when we see stuff like mouse getting banned and we see like the whole world being outraged by it, right-wing media is not doing much about it. They're not saying anything about this, despite the fact that this is exactly the kind of thing that they would say that this is like cancel culture. This is something that they shouldn't do, and yet they're being silent about it. Like, this is the kind of thing that we would usually see people like Tucker Carlson, Candace Owens, or even in, or even internet personalities like The Quartering, Steven Crowder, or Ben Shapiro, or any of those guys, that they would constantly rant about. Like, what, what Candace Owens said. Like, this is the thing that's, like, breaking the fabric of our society. This is censorship. This is cancel culture. The fact that a school would flat-out ban a book that talks about the horrors of the Holocaust, and yet they remain silent. The fact that they're not saying anything. The fact that they would rather spend their energy on the green M&M or on Minnie Mouse. And their, 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 their silence there is deafening. It's, it's honestly shocking. And it really says a lot more about them. And unfortunately, we are in an age where there are, not all of them, of course, but there are certain conservatives, especially those in the far right, and especially those that do support Donald Trump, are comfortable with Nazism more than what th what they probably want to admit. That not that the fact that there are even Nazis that are going around, and yet they're being silent about it. It is honestly shocking that they're not. Again, this is something that really it's a case that. Their silence actually says a lot more about their position on this than if they would actually comment. And especially like even in, uh, again, going back to Florida, the fact that there were literal Nazi rallies that are happening and there have been a few Republicans that did call them out, but not Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis would say nothing about it, would not even want to do anything uh, uh, about this. And it really does set a dangerous precedence about the far right, about how they're okay with letting stuff like this happen, to silence about the horrors of of um, of World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust, and that honestly scares me. That like we might literally that I know it might sound crazy, but we might literally see the rise of Nazism happening. That we are seeing more and more people being unapologetically Nazis, and that they that they are free to do whatever they want because like even the powers that be wouldn't legitimately want to do anything to go and stop them like even in canada like during the weekend there was the whole like anti-vaxxer protest that happened at the capitol in ottawa and there were certain people that were waving literal nazi flags and like none of these anti-vaxxers did anything to go and stop these people from waving those Nazi flags or anything like that. They just let it happen and accept those people as their own. And even like people and like even those people who do comment, like even people outside of Canada, when they would see that happening, when they see those Nazi flags happening, they would still say like, well, I do support freedom over security. So I would side with those people. Like the real enemy is Justin Trudeau. Like, are you kidding, man? You would literally be buddies with Nazis, so with literal Nazis, by the way, so that you would go and get what you want. It's dangerous. Like, seriously, it truly is frightening and dangerous of how the far right is comfortable with Nazism and how we are literally seeing this rise of Nazism because their silence regarding the whole censorship of Mouse 
is just it, it, it terrifies me. It's just something that this is honestly something that I really want to comment. Yes, like honestly, I'll give the benefit of the doubt of the Tennessee school board that they're just a bunch of idiots that have no idea what they're doing. Like, I think honestly, like they should go and unban Mouse. Like they 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 really should like backtrack on what they have done so that, you know, they're not viewed bad upon, you know, they're not viewed badly from around the world. But but still, though, I just feel like this whole situation, like we really are like, I know it might sound crazy, but the truth is, yes, we are seeing the rise of Nazism, not just like in the United States, but all around the world. And it's terrifying. And we need to take action. We need to start like we need to do something like not just us, but even like the powers that be need to do something in order to go and criminalize these pe these people because again if we're like if we don't learn from our history then we are doomed to repeat it so i know that's a pretty like frightening and concerning kind of rant that i went on a little there but uh, now it's time that i would like to go and ask you all how do you feel about the tennessee school board or this tennessee school board banning mouse are you do you guys disagree with them how do you feel about the whole situation with how people are responding with a uh, mouse let me know what you think uh let's see what we got here even though i've yet to read the book i know for a fact that uh this move is idiotic and horrific mouse is one of many works that need to exist and need to be shown to teach us about uh, the horrors of war and the dark and the darkest side of humanity to deny people the chance of learning history no matter how dark it is is downright dangerous and this will lead people to become ignorant and possibly become bad people as well exactly this is why you need stuff like critical race theory and why you need stuff like mouse as well because yeah like all oh, there are there may be some profanities and there may be some imagery you don't want to see but you have to see in order to emphasize the reality of who those evil people are you know like to really highlight the dark side of reality you need to go and do stuff like this even if you don't agree with it even if you don't agree with showing it to your kids it's stuff that they need to see anyways that's why it's honestly important that like you need to open up and you need to see these people like they they need to read mouse that's the reality of this uh let's see Okay, I, uh, oh, I heard about this. Hate. I hate the school board's decision. I remember I was in eighth grade, and one of the books my school recommended, uh, was Mouse regarding a World War II books, uh, in English. This was in 2009 in a middle school in Ohio. Honestly, these conservative schools scare me more and more and more with each story. Uh, from a high school in Texas wanting Holocaust books from opposing views to this hick town in Tennessee... The board members are all white if they don't want to uh, be called Nazis, then show Mouse and others. Exactly. Like, these kinds of decisions. And honestly, like, really the most dangerous thing, like, really the most dangerous thing that you need to pay attention to and prevent from actually happening is regarding what's educate you know it's regarding education because you want to make sure that future generations are actually taught and raised well and that they don't become bigots that they don't become racist and that they certainly do not become white supremacists that we need to teach them that it's bad that even being racist is as bad as being a child groomer that's what you need to go and teach kids that you need to go and did not like we need to go and criminalize hate speech that's what we need to go and ch and teach them right now but the fact that that these conservatives are going out of their way to try to prevent that from happening and try to reverse course on it that's the real dangerous thing because it's going to raise future like it's going to shape future generations of how they view the world and that's the part that is very concerning uh, let's see Again, going straight into the hypocrisy of right-wingers, uh, depicting the Holocaust as how it was is an absolute no-no, but uh, discriminatory behavior in schools, all good for them. All this news does is just reveal the true colors of conservatism and how they're perfectly okay with racism and literally being Nazis. Also, you think about banning the Bible from containing profane language, maybe Barton Milhouse were onto something. Exactly. And not to mention the fact that 
I'm just going to go and say this right now that honestly, these right wing people, like when they're trying to ban critical race theory and stuff like that, they don't care about kids. No, there is no such thing as a nationalist that actually cares about children or there's no such thing as as like people who oppose critical race theory that actually cares about the children whatsoever because they're not protecting the children. They're protecting racism because if they actually do care about kids, then they would do something and they would go and take action to make sure that no school shootings can ever happen again. Like, that's one thing, like, if they really are worried about children and what they're being, and what's going on in schools, they should do something to make sure that they could, be, like, don't ban mouse, ban school shootings, ban guns in the schools in general. Like, that's some, that is honestly something that they should do. Like, you want to, you want to show us that you care about kids, then do something about guns that's killing them. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, what other comments do we have? Ah, there we go. Uh, banning a book like Mouse just because it might contain some nudity and profanity is absolutely ridiculous. When you also see that it was only for 8th grade classes, it makes me, it, it makes it look even more petty and stupid. Also, Matt, this isn't the first time a state would ban teaching something really important. The Texas state back in July 2021 passed a bill to remove the requirement to teach people that the Ku Klux Klan is wrong and filled with awful people. It's just absolutely horrifying and scary. Exactly. Like, that's something... Yeah, and that's honestly something that we need to stop. That should be, like, one of the highest priorities to make sure. Because if you want to prevent future generations to become Nazis or KKK members, then you have to make sure to emphasize in the school board that these people are evil and that no one should be allowed to be them. Uh, I'll read uh, one more comment before we move on to the next story. Uh, what else we have? Uh, okay, yeah. The mouse banning was absolutely stupid, and they don't want to let people go into the dark side of history. And yet, I've heard about Nazi rallies happening in Europe, Mexico, Chile, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Russia, Argentina, Canada, or even Brazil or the U.S. And notice all the countries I mentioned are all are European or European descended majority countries it seems to happen in those countries the most and we need to unban mouse so we can prevent more of those rallies well the, the thing is is that with the te with the tennessee school board like the the thing is what we can do like the most powerful tool that we can have is to go and educate ourselves and i think that would be my closing statement on this is that we need to go like Honestly, education is one of the most powerful tools that we can have in the world, more so than any tanks or any bazookas or guns or anything like that. So what we should do right now is educate ourselves about what happened in the horrors of World War II. And that's why, honestly, even though like I'm not sponsored or endorsed or anything like that, you should go and buy a copy of Mouse, that you should read what happened. You should read about the, the harsh realities of what occurred or even watch um, Shin Schindler's List. I remember when I was like in the eighth grade or ninth grade, I had to be taught about what happened in World War II, and we had to watch Schindler's List to watch the horrors and the realities of what happened. And that's another great thing to go and check out. If you don't have time for Mouse, then you could probably have time for Schindler's List. So that's honestly something that I just want to mention. Just please educate yourself. Okay, so I know that we've went on some very heavy themes lately, you know, that <laughs> I know I went on some pretty, like, pretty heavy rants over there, but um, I think now it's time we should go and unwind a little bit, you know, let, let, let's let, let's try to balance things out with something a little bit more light and maybe something a little bit more fun and Oh man, I got a treat for you all. I got something special. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. But, um, I have a trailer for an upcoming animated film that's coming sometime in, like, um, early this year. But I don't know how else to introduce this because it's a true sight to behold. So, people, may I introduce you to Pinocchio, A True Story. There you go. Now, what should we name you? Hold on. Hey, there we go. There you go. Now, what should we name you? 
Maybe Leonardo. No, he'd grow up to be a turtle who only cares about pizza. I don't believe my eyes. Your name will be Pinocchio. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? I've got the whole world to see. You are too special, Pinocchio. The world is full of people who could harm you. The Timeless Story. Our last few shows barely had any audience. We just need to come up with a new act. Ooh, come on! You thought you knew. The coach is headed for the cliff. She's gonna fall. Hold on! <laughs> Senorina, Hallio! <laughs> <laughs> Are you made of wood? You will become a star, my boy. Ladies and gentlemen, Pinocchio! <laughs> it looks like our wooden Romeo is in love with Bella. Did you seriously think that you and Bella... <laughs> There is a fairy. Her name is Lucilda. I'm sure she could turn you into a real boy. Let's go, Tibbo! Great adventures away! Take the adventure. I did want to see the world, but I realized she is the most beautiful thing the world has to offer. With no strings attached. Pinocchio is not just a puppet, he's a miracle. And miracles are priceless. That went straight over my tongue. Featuring the voices of... Holly Shore. I'm made out of high quality material. John Heater. I promise to look after him at all times. And Tom Kenny. I just need you, Pinocchio. Love. Pinocchio, you'll be a star someday, no doubt. I don't need another human performer. I need a talking puppet. We'll put on a show that won't soon forget. Pinocchio. A true story. Gotcha! You've only seen my good side. But now, you'll see my bad side! <laughs> Mamma mia! Brighten up the world. Yes, folks! What you have witnessed here is Pinocchio, A True Story, which is going to be coming out on digital and DVD on March 22nd, 2020. 22. Oh boy! <laughs> oh, oh dear boy, new subscriber. Thank oh thank you thank you so much. Uh uh Amar love uh, Amar loves art. Oh man. Oh that is this trailer, man. Oh oh this is beauty! Pure beauty that we have behold! Now, first of all, let me just comment the title. The title itself, Pinocchio, A True Story. Wait a minute. Something doesn't sound right here. This is the true, it's a true story, but you're telling it's a true story of Pinocchio? Which one is it? Because you can't have both. You either tell me the story of Pinocchio or you tell me a true story. But this is apparently, this is Pinocchio's true story. Like, how does this work? Was there actually a, a an actual boy that made of wood that came to life? I have no freaking clue. But apparently, according to this, this is what actually happened with Pinocchio. This is the true story that we got here. And oh boy. Okay, so I think it is safe to say that this is crap. This is a pretty crappy looking animated feature. Yeah, it's like obviously one of those like it ain't just direct to DVD. This is like direct to bargain bin kind of movie. Like immediately if you just want to find something like, so, like something quick for the kids to enjoy for five bucks, it's got to be something like this. But I think like even though like yeah, the animation, it's safe to say it looks like crap. It looks dumb. Even the plot line, like, especially with the way that they just want to make, um, like, they want to get, they, they want to turn Pinocchio into, like, this love story where he falls in love with a girl named Bella in the circus and stuff. Like, even with that, I think the true highlight of this has to be the voice acting. And apparently there are three people that they have highlighted here. One that they have John Hend uh, John Header, who's playing this horse that he like he really sounds like he just didn't want to be there. Like this is obviously like just for the sake of the paycheck and that he really has nothing else better to do. So it's like 
I might as well voice this cartoon. Why not? And then there is Tom Kenny, who is playing Geppetto in this. And OK, I will say that when it comes to Tom Kenny's performance, I think honestly, he's the only good thing in this movie, or at least the only good thing that they are showing us in this trailer. He is actually uh, pretty good, honestly. Like, even when you hear his performance, it, like, even though, like, let's be honest, okay, the, the dialogue here is garbage. Like, it is so stupid. Even, like, the, even at the start, like, the whole Leonardo thing, like, th like this scene. Maybe Leonardo. No, he'd grow up to be a turtle who only cares about pizza. Like, really? That has to be a line in this? Uh, 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 okay, that is just dumb. Like, okay, that that's like forceful pop culture reference right there. But for real, though, his performance in here, I actually find to be really good because he actually does sound like a legitimate caring Pinocchio uh, Geppetto where it's almost as if he took, you know, like Tom Kenny took notes from what was done in Walt Disney's Pinocchio and the Geppetto in that movie is translated into his performance. And there are times where like you can actually hear him um be pretty genuine and like be caring like um uh, there's one part that i did unironically like it's uh actually i think over here are oh, priceless that went straight over my tummy no not not this one sorry that went straight over my tummy it's like to offer oh, where is it it's somewhere at the end it's to look after him at and tom kenny i just need you pinocchio <laughs> Yeah, like there are times like you can hear that, you know, he's kind, he is heartfelt. So honestly, on that part, I felt like he actually did a very nice job. But then there's the starring role, the legend himself, the true master of like the man that made Pinocchio a true story. Polly Shore, Polly Shore's performance. Oh, my God. This is this truly does define this movie because oh my god, Polly Shore like right off the bat gave us such a wonderful kind performance that I have never heard since Tommy was so like just let's hear this again like just take a moment to hear. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? I've got the whole world to see. You are too. <laughs> it's just. Oh my god, like the amount of zero, like the amount of cares that he gave, which is none. Like just the tone of it. Like, oh my god, there is no like no emotion. Like he he was just reading the script. Like that's all he is. There's no acting behind it. It literally is just like reading the script. No cares, no emotion, nothing. Just like Father, when is it going to be my time to go and see the world? It's, it's just, that is it. And oh my God. And it's like pretty constant throughout this entire trailer. Like it's, oh my God. Like even when he sees a girl in peril, like this part. Clip, she's going to fall. Yeah, like here. The coach is headed for the cliff. She's going to fall. <laughs> she's, the coach is heading off the cliff. She's going to fall. Oh my god, just, like, everything about this, like, with that performance, I, it's just beautiful. It's the levels of bad where it, it, it gives it brand new life. It's just something, it really is the kind of bad that, like, we've never seen before, you know, we've never had in, like, the grand majority of other movies. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Like, that's what it is. It's like his performance giving us the most unenthusiastic Pinocchio. Like, you know what? Screw Guillermo del Toro. Screw his garbage stop motion bullcrap he's doing on Netflix. We got the true Pinocchio masterpiece right here. And it's called Pinocchio, a true story starring Ta starring Polly Shore. Like, oh my God. I love this. I freaking love this performance oh my god this oh it's it's so good i'm almost tempted man i am almost tempted to buy to buy this dvd to actually see it for myself because i know this is bad i think we can all agree that this is a pretty stupid looking adaptation especially with how like 
The animation is just low quality. The plot line sounds absolutely stupid. It's like, it's like, che- it's like cheesy in a way that it's like spoiled cheese in, 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 in a sense. Like, it's just stupidly cheesy with the way that they want to make it a romance story. It's just, there is nothing here. The, well, okay, the, almost, there's almost nothing here that is good. Like, yeah, they got Tom Kenny, and it's nice that they actually give him, like, they actually give him credit here. Like, they're actually advertising that they have Tom Kenny. Like, that is one thing that I will say is actually pretty cool. Like, yeah, because, like, sure, it's a low... You know, it's a, it's a, it, it is like this low budget animated feature, but the fact like they, he's got top billing in this, that I find to be cool, and that's the one good thing that th- that this movie really did, and I do applaud Pinocchio a True Story for actually doing that, for actually like, you know, giving um, credit to voice actors to where their credit is due, and what Tom Kenny did here is actually pretty solid. Like he is a good, like he does sound like a good Geppetto in this so far, but. The rest, though, it's just crap, but it really is Polly Shore's performance that just, it sells it for me. It's just so beautiful. Oh my god, it's just, man, only in stuff like this could you get a performance like Polly it's, oh my god, I, wow, it's, it's gorgeous. It, it truly is. You can't get this anywhere else. From, from, from freaking Paul, from like, Polly Shore, a true artist of cinema. We need to create, like, seriously, the SAG Awards need to create best voice acting just so they could give one to him for Pinocchio, a true story. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, what are your opinions on Pinocchio, a true story? What did you think of the trailer that you have seen? Let me know what you think on all this. Okay, <clears throat> let's see. Why do I need this to read comments? Hold on a sec. Sorry about that. So let's see. Outside of Tom Kenny's good performance, wow. Bland animation, lame jokes, terrible story, bad writing, and the title that are supposed to make me believe that this is a true story alongside with bad voice acting from Napoleon Dynamite and freaking Pauly Shore himself. Yeah, this look like it's gonna suck regardless. Then again, it's from Lionsgate, so it shouldn't be a surprise. What else do you expect from the studio that brought us Norm of the North? Well, I mean, okay, I don't think it's the studio that made Norm of the North here. It's it's from the studio that distributed Norm of the North. And yeah, and you know, the funny thing with John Hedder is that he is a very good actor. Like, he can actually do deliver good performances. Like, yeah, a lot of people may know him more as either Napoleon Dynamite or Chicken Joe in Surf's Up. But there have been to- there have been other moments where he was really good. Like, there's a movie called Walt Before Mickey that shows, like, the origins of Walt Disney before he made Mickey Mouse. Honestly, it's not really that great of a movie, but I would say the best thing about that film is John Hedder's performance as Roy O. Disney. He was phenomenal. And like for Disney fans, I would recommend like you would check it, you would check it out just for his performance alone. And I, you know, honestly, if there is like a bigger budgeted Walt Disney biopic or something like that, I would want uh John I would want John Hedder to come back as Roy O. Disney. He did a beautiful job on that film with that role. Uh let's see what else we got here. Uh there may have been uh, th- that may have been the most entertaining trailer I've seen for an animated movie. I mean, my god, everything is just completely falls apart and I love it. The acting is atrocious, the animation's cheap. The jokes are lame, and I just ate that. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> this right here is a must-watch. Screw Robert Zemeckis. Forget Walt Disney. Piss on Guillermo del Toro. This is the true Pinocchio adaptation. This is going to be the number... Yeah, this is going to be the ultimate Pinocchio movie. Pinocchio, a true story, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Low quality voice acting, check. Bad animation, check. Uh, giving a character a love interest for no reason, check. Pop culture references, check. One good voice actor, check. Being based on a classic fairy tale, check. Yep, this hits all the checks for a movie that you would find in a DVD bin in Walmart. 
Yep, call me to a local bargain bin near you. Let's see. Oh my god, that was amazing. So, so dumb. God, I want to make this my movie night with my sister uh, like we did with cats. Oh, Matt, it's a true story about a wooden man trying to make it big and being bored and boredly, and boredly falling in love with a blue-haired girl. What a poor use of Tom Kenny and a blue-haired girl. I can't wait for an animat watches. Honestly, I'd be open to this, actually. You know, the more I think about it, the more that... Maybe I should. Maybe I should legitimately do an animat watches of Pinocchio a true story. We might actually have some material here. I mean, like, I'm ha I had a blast just listening to Pinocchio a true story, like, in terms of just um what we got here in the trailer. I had a blast just hearing Polly Shore's performance. Oh, my God. I, I, I wonder how it's going to be with um with the whole feature film. So I might consider getting this DVD. Let's see, I think I'm going to read one more comment before we uh, move on to uh, the final story here. All I could say is, WTF did I just watch? Um, I don't think I've seen a so bad it's hilarious trailer. The acting from Pauly Shore is so bad it's entertaining. The animation is just hilariously bad. And honestly, Tom Kenny is way too good for this. Uh, did he just need a paycheck in between seasons of SpongeBob because it seems like it? So overall... This is an animat watches in the making. Now, honestly, when it comes to voice acting and stuff like that, you know, like they just want, you know, they enjoy the performances itself. Like even if it's like a stupidly bad movie or stuff like that, voice actors themselves, like they can have, they can have fun with it. They can have a blast. And I'm sure that is the case with Tom Kenny where he actually did some, uh, like, yeah, he did. Yeah. It's obviously pretty stupid, but he probably had a great time doing this. And, you know, he just want to ha have a moment where he can actually play as Geppetto and play as a caring father. I don't see why not. Like if he wants to do it, go for it. And I mean, even speaking as a voice actor myself, I actually did have experience, uh, doing, you know, doing performances in which would require me to do some work that might not be so great that have yet to be released, but I had a blast doing the, the voiceovers for them. So I just want to state that right now. And if you are excited to see this movie come out for Pinocchio, a true story to come out on March 22nd, or, or actually, if you if you are excited to see Pinocchio True Story come out, then wait until March 22nd, 2022 for it to come out either on uh, well to come out on DVD and on digital. And this is it, folks. We are finally at the end, exactly at the two hour mark where we shall begin. And with this grand finale, I want to talk about the latest animated feature that has been released. As you guys probably know, Disney Plus on Friday has put out the Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild, the sixth installment of the Ice Age franchise and the first one to be done by Disney instead of Blue Sky Studios, considering that Blue Sky Studios is dead now. And I can tell you right now, yes, I will be doing a review of it. And long story short, of course, it absolutely sucks. But one very interesting factor about Buck Wild is that there are a lot of missing characters in this movie. I mean, you do have a lot of your main ones, of course, like you got Sid, Manny, and Diego, you got Ellie, you got Crash and Eddie, of course, and you do have Buck Wild. But when it comes to many of the other characters that, that appeared throughout the franchise, they're actually not there. Like, one thing I can confirm is that all the characters that appeared in either Continental Drift and on Collision Course are no longer there. Uh, there is also Peaches that is missing. You probably remember uh, Ellie and Manny's, da uh, Manny's daughter that literally was birthed in Dawn of the Dinosaurs. But probably the most shocking of them all is the fact that there is no Scrat. Like, I, I can assure you, nowhere in the feature do you ever see Scrat. 
And I was thinking, well, maybe it's just because like it's executive demands or it's just, um, you know, the right the, the writers didn't want to put in the effort to go and include Scrat and find like whatever crazy adventures that he would go in order to find his acorn. But truth may be stranger than fiction, because what actually did happen, believe it or not, is that, well, it's not that they don't want to use him. It's the fact that they cannot use him because Disney does not have the rights to Scrat. Yes, you heard me right. Neither 20th Century nor Disney actually owns the character of Scrat from Ice Age, which you think would probably be crazy, but what actually happened here? Well, going on my source here on Looper, that is actually because of a lawsuit that was decades in the making where the, where the plaintiff actually legitimately won. And believe it or not, it was actually Disney that gave away the rights, that they were the ones who decided to end it all and to say, here you go, you can have the rights to Scrat. So I'm going to go and uh, read from Looper here. As it states, uh, his absence has to do with the long-running dispute over who actually created Scrat. Ivy Silberstein, a cartoonist and fashion designer based in New York, claimed to have created a squirrel-rat hybrid animal back in 1999. According to Silberstein, Fox took notice of the character and repurposed it for the use of the upcoming film Ice Age. Silberman, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> Silberman sp spent 18 years battling for the trademark in court and went to various news outlets to try to get the story out about who really created the character. She didn't have any success until 2019, when the Fox Disney Corporation officially agreed to settle the case. Silverstein finally received her trademark on July 7th, 2020. And on July 28th, 2022, the day uh, Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild was released, she tweeted a photo holding the trademark with the caption, No Scrat in Disney Ice Age 6. Silberstein won her 20-year battle for Scrat to be removed from Ice Age, resulting in his very notable absent in the Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild. In fact, this is the tweet that they were actually talking about. Here's um, Ivy over here wearing a, a t-shirt of Scrat.com in which she owns and how she actually owns the rights to Scrat, which her version is written with a Q. And uh, on her tweet... In which she wrote in, in uh, I Want Justice, she wrote, No Scrat in Disney, uh, in Disney Ice Age 6. Thank you Walt Disney Company and Abigail Disney for respecting my trademark and character Scrat. I created May 19th, 1999. 20 years ago, March 12, 2002. Uh, oh, 20 years ago, March 12, 2020. Uh, sorry about that. Let me just rephrase that. 20 years ago, March 12th, 2002, the first Ice Age was released. It's been a 20-year fight. I won. So that's pretty much the interesting thing, is the fact that Scrat is not owned by Disney. And this is honestly something that really did shock the uh the the entire the entire uh, animation community over here and especially amongst those that actually still do care about ice age the fact that we would see um that 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 we wouldn't even see scrat in the movie and that's mainly because disney doesn't own it which is kind of a major shock factor because you got to keep in mind we are talking about the Walt Disney Company here. We are talking about the most notorious, the most cruel, the most ruthless when it comes to handling copyright and to make sure that they still own the rights to their properties for as long as they pro they possibly can. Yes, a lot of people are talking about how right now, in only a few years' time, that the that Mickey Mouse's copyright is about to expire. But I can guarantee you that Disney it will be manipulating copyright rules once again so that they could still keep Mickey Mouse for centuries to come. 
And not to mention about the numerous of horror stories that would come from how Disney would go and handle copyright and how they are so dangerously overprotective of their uh, of their IPs to the point that they would not hesitate to crush anyone and everyone so that they maintain the rights no matter what. And the fact that they don't own Scrat... And the fact that, like, even in the context of the story where it's actually because of Disney, that company decided to let go of the entire court case instead of letting it go on? Like, what? That is, like, one of the biggest plot twists that you can imagine. Especially when it comes to what could arguably be one of the most popular cartoon characters in the early 21st century. Keep in mind that when it comes to Scrat, he's not just some funny sidekick comedy relief um, that would constantly appear in the Ice Age movies. This is the character that many would say not only is he the official mascot of Ice Age, but he was also the official mascot of Blue Sky Studios, where when they would show the um, when they would go and show the logo, often we would see Scrat still like trying to run around and chase that acorn. Like, his, like, the imagery of Scrat is iconic. Like, we all recognize, like, this crazy squirrel trying to chase his acorn in a Looney Tunes-style fashion. And yet, despite the popularity, despite the iconography, the fact that Disney would let go of that, the fact that they don't want to go and fight uh, on, the copyright uh, on the copyright, that they decided to let this person go, is mythological it's almost unheard of in this case especially when this is a story that uh, like for someone who would research about animation history i've heard about the story time and time and time again we would constantly hear about these stories about how there are some people who claim that oh disney stole my idea this is my idea for this specific character like they would say this all the time and they've done so so many times for stuff like monsters inc for cars and for frozen they had several but we know from time to time some of these people are very disingenuous and they just want their piece of the pie uh, on the major success of of um what di uh, of like what Disney has done and it's not just Disney some other studios have fallen for that as well like Dreamworks actually do have a few of their own that turn out to actually be very fraudulent and in, in in the case of Disney, it's always highly suspicious whenever they would do so because the lawsuits would often happen after the success. You know, they don't happen like during production or when we would hear about, oh, when this is coming out. I mean, there are a few that do, but they can be very rare, but they usually go after them after the big success uh, that Disney would have with their movies. And they say, oh, but this is my idea. I want to have some money that they're making and and. and stuff like that and it never goes well because Disney would have like some of the strongest and some of the best lawyers out there so it just never goes well for those people who claim that they are the original creators so from there not only did Disney let so from there not only did Disney give this one a pass but the fact that they're letting it pass with one of the with again one of the most famous cartoon characters in the early 21st century like, I honestly, I, I like to this day, I still need to register in my mind of what this ultimately means. Like, the, uh, like, I don't know if this really is a statement of like the dedication of the original person who made Scrat of um, Ivy Silberstein. Like, I don't know if, the, if it's based on that crazy dedication or if it really is the fact that Disney just doesn't necessarily care all that much about the Blue Sky properties, that they don't necessarily fully care about Ice Age to the point that they can live without owning the rights to Scratch or having any of like any materials that they would go in and like have Scrat appear in like different stuff. Uh, like, I don't know, like, or maybe like we will see Scrat in the future, but they will ask for the rights uh, from I I Ivy Silberman and that, you know, they'll pay royalties and their fair share uh, like to her and stuff like that. Maybe they will do so. But still, it, it, it's just shocking to see like how did like the, the, that Disney again with their reputation 
of co- of how they would handle copyright and they would just like hey you're all right fine here you can have scrat like they they would just not care for scrat it's 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 honestly crazy and it's honestly the kind of thing that for me personally i would love to go and dive deep into this is honestly the kind that i i'm honestly considering to this day that maybe I can actually do uh, a, a whole video on this. It's just so fascinating. Like, re- seriously, like when you think about the idea that Disney does not own the rights to Scrat, like what? How, how else would you react? Like, what else would you think about this? It, it, it's crazy. It, it truly is. So honestly, this is just a little bit of a preview. What I'm discussing here, I know for a fact that we're only scratching just the tip of the iceberg here. And there's so much more that we could get into about this whole like controversy, how like how uh, Ivy Silverstein really got into this uh, entire court case. Like, I really want to learn more about this. So this is going to be something that I will pledge in the future to do. It's just it, it really is fascinating. Like out of all the characters that Disney acquired from Fox, why do they not want to own Scrat? It's cra- it, It's really nuts. It, it truly is. I, it's just something that I really want to go and um, bring up. So this is just something uh, to look out for in the future of my videos. All right. So with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask, what are your thoughts of the fact that Disney does not own the rights to Scrat? Like, what are your thoughts about all this? Like, honestly, it's hard to really find the right words for this. And I want to know, like, how you feel. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, but Scrat was the best thing about Ice Age. He made a huge glacier move. He said sa- uh, he saved many animals from drowning. He created our con- uh, our continent by he- uh, by heating to the center of the earth and sa- uh, and sank Scratlantis and created our solar system using a say ship. He is basically God. I saw Buck Wild and it's even less fun without Scrat. All joking aside, I wonder what the owner of Scrat is going to do with the little rodent in the future. Yeah, that is actually a good point. That's also something I want to know. Like, okay, she won her court case. What is she going to do with Scrat now? Like, what will she do? What what is she going to um what what is she going to do with the character? Is she going to make her own merchandise with it? Like, what what are you going to do? Seriously. Uh, let's see now. I remember watching Buck Wild last week. Uh, throughout the 90 minutes, I wanted to die. But with all this, the fact that Disney didn't even bother fighting back for Scrat is absolutely insane. But let's be real. I definitely felt Scrat's absence in Buck Wild. Uh, I wouldn't go into detail. All I could say is at least Collision Course made me laugh a couple of times. I may need to cleanse my mind with a good movie. The, like uh, either the Peanuts movie or, Pro- or Coco or Pinocchio, A True Story. Well, unfortunately, you cannot. You still have to wait uh, a couple. Like you, you still gotta wait like a few more weeks before the release of, of Pinocchio: a True Story. I know that you are all excited for Pinocchio: a True Story, but you still gotta wait. Oh, let's see here. Uh, uh, even though Ice Age 6 sucked and worse than Hotel Transylvania 4, I thought Scrat wasn't in there because of writing or executive reasons, but hearing that it is all because Disney and not even Fox doesn't have the rights to Scrat and give it away to the original creator, that explains a lot. I didn't know about this until now, and I can't believe that just happened. Even if Scrat was in Ice Age 6, he alone is not enough to save the movie, but wow, I am shocked about this. Yeah, you definitely got that right. To quote Robotnik, I was not expect I was not expecting that. Uh, Disney is probably the most notorious company when it comes to keeping their copyrighted characters. So seeing them let go of Scrat just like that is such a huge shock. I'm truly curious to why Disney decided to do this in the first place. Then again, Disney has shown to not really care about Blue Sky in the first place. Yeah, it could be that. It's like, it's not because of Scrat. It's just because, you know, it's it's Blue Sky. You know, even for Dizzy, it's like, it's Blue Sky. Who the fridge cares? <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, What else we got here? If Scrat not appeared in the next sequel, it's better for Disney not to make another Ice Age movie as a franchise uh, since it is starting to become boring with story and moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's going to happen. There is going to be an Ice Age 7. Uh, w- w- what's better for Disney to do something experimental for future animated projects? Why not create a Disney animated film for older audiences? 
Eh, who knows? Who knows, man? All right, I think I'm going to read one more comment uh, before we end this off. Scrat is my entire childhood. He is my boy. I love him, and I am uh, a massive fan. Seeing this news, I am so happy he is away from those awful people at Disney, and he gains full freedom. I hate modern Disney, and seeing Ivy win the case after follow following it for years, I am so happy he is free. I am now anticipating the upcoming Blue Sky series, which was rumored to be cancelled but isn't anymore. Scrat Tales. I am finally free from watching the awful sequels just to see him. Well, I guess... You got that going for you. And with that said, I think that should conclude this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Oh boy, what an episode we just went through. Quite an explosive one, but still definitely one we did end things off on a lighter note with some laughs. Oh boy, that definitely was truly a crazy episode. But let's tune in for next time, and maybe we'll see if the craziness will continue. But hopefully, the explosions and the madness will be maybe a bit more positive, like the end of this episode. So with all that said and done, I would like to go and say thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, see you later, dudes.